different variations of this. You, you flip it. You flip it over the lens on your phone, and it gives you, um, depending on which which one you get, you know, five or ten x magnification when you're taking a picture. All right. So where are we? We're on identifying. So references are helpful. Um, you know, ortho problem solvers. Probably not bad, actually, because you know it gives you here's the common problems on this particular um, issue. Certainly, um, always a good baseline to, to just ask: have, have you had a, you know have you had a soil sample in the last five years from that particular location? Because <coughs> um, even if there is a disease or an ins insect issue. If soil conditions are not good, then the plant's not thriving, and it's making it more susceptible. You know, less. You know, defenses are lowered in that plant to fight against. Um, so just making sure you've got good pH and, and good nutrient status, and then, uh, if necessary, samples to the NC SU Plant Disease and Insect Clinic, which you've already heard about. That's where Matt Bertone works. You're an entomologist. Um, teacher, instructor, um, and you can send physical samples. This is just a tobacco sample that I sent in, um, and, and uh, we don't, we actually don't use envelopes anymore. They want you to put it in a box, but, um, you know, you can kind of cut things up uh, into pieces and put them in plastic bags and, and put them in a box and ship them, uh, but again, pictures are great and, and they're free. And uh, those would go through Ashley because Ashley needs more work to do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, um, no, but they, they do need to go, uh, the physical samples definitely need to go through an extension. I think the digital samples do as well. I think. I know they greatly prefer it, at least. Yeah. All right, and then so you've, uh, let's see, what were our steps? Uh, prevent, monitor, identify, and then assess. And as far as assessing, you know, there's this concept of economic threshold in agriculture, which says that you don't do a treatment if you're not gonna increase your profit, right? <laughs> so if, if the pest is causing you $40 per acre worth of yield loss, but it's gonna cost you $50 an acre to treat, you don't come out ahead by treating, right? Um, but we can kind of use the same idea in our landscapes by kind of thinking about, and it's more of just a, a subjective, analysis of what, what's the value of this plant to you and how much is it worth to, to try and you know keep it looking good or, or deal with a pest issue that's come up so you know if you got this beautiful flowering cherry that's the centerpiece or focal point of you know your Japanese garden or whatever you know you're probably going to spend big bucks um, and, be, and happily to control um, uh, the, the board, that, what's the board that gets in the trunk? The oh, like an ambrosia beetle? No. No. Uh, anyway, well, you know, whatever the problem is, you know, you're going to be willing to, to spend some time and money on that. You know, but if it's an annual flower bed and, you know, you spent 30 bucks on a flat of marigolds, you know, you're not going to go out and buy a $30 product. You, you might just go and buy a flat petunias and, and, and or vice versa. I guess this is anyway. You, you know, it's so you, you you make that calculation in your head and, and think about what it's going to cost you. Um, you know, here's an example, uh, and, and this is a new and emerging pest. Did, did Matt talk about um, the emerald ash borer? I have that. You what? I you, have that. You I'm have that. Afraid it needs to come down with it. Yeah. Um, so emerald ash borer, just to review, is a new, a 
exotic invasive insect pest that's present in North Carolina. And if you have an ash tree that has any value to you that you want to preserve, it is probably worthwhile spending 30 bucks a year to do a treatment as a preventive measure. Because if the ash tree gets um, attacked by the emerald ash, ash borer, it dies. I mean, it's like 99% fatal. So. Is that what it looks like when an insect has traveled along under the skin of the tree? Exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. This was like one of the, this, this, this picture was actually one of the first trees that was identified. I was there. <laughs> I was there when the, when the Emerald Ash Borer first came to North Carolina. Uh, this was actually one of the first trees, uh, you know, the first found identified location. I forget if it was Granville or Person County in North Carolina. And uh, I don't know if they peeled the bark back or if the bark had already sloughed off. Uh, but yeah, you can see where the larva has. Um, tunneled through, um, yeah, and basically it girdles the, the tree. It girdles What year did it arrive? What year did it arrive? Uh, it's the last five years, probably. What was the name of that again? Emerald Ash Borer. Emerald Ash Borer. Where did it come from? Uh, Asia, Ashley, Asia? I'm um, furiously Googling. Um, I think it's yeah, like, Eastern Asia, and I, I know it's been around a little bit longer than that. Via, via Chicago, I think. Yeah, because I remember, well, because I remember it in Indiana a lot earlier than I ever heard about it yeah. here. If it was first detected in the Midwest, they, you know, global shipping, these things get moved around. You know, wooden pallet made out of an ash tree in China or something. Um, with all of our cell phone magnifying clips um, <laughs> that came in a shipping container. Um, and, and part of that, you know, so here's the, the, the economic threshold concept. You know, am I going to spray it because I found one, you know, caterpillar? No, I'm going to pick it up and squish it. So, but if I've got, you know, an infestation, can we um, do blinds? I think it's the blinds. I think it might be. Oh, it's, yeah, it's this one right here. It's this first one. If you just, if you just turn the, turn the rod on, there you go. Yeah. Whoa! So, but if you got infestation, you know, that's okay, you might need to do some spraying. And, and then you're ready to select your control measure. And, and again, just emphasizing for your own benefit, as well as any, anybody that you're advising, that uh, there's lots of different ways to control insect pests, and the pesticides are always a last resort. Now, now, in some cases, you know, they are the only option, you know. It, you know this is the only, you know, this is the only way to control it is, you know, the emerald ash borer, um, you know, that's, that's the option. But if, if there is another option, you certainly want to encourage that. So if we're doing that monitoring and we see that cluster of insect eggs and we can, you know, just flick those off, uh, if we can pull off the, the bag worm, bags off of the Leyland cypress or the other trees that it gets onto before you get a whole infestation. Uh, you know, these are the azalea leaf, leaf galls and, and those actually, you know, hand removal, clipping them out, that is the solution. You know, there's not anything you, you need to spray on that for that leaf gall. Just the individual leaves that are having that or should you take a portion of the plant away? Stay again. I, I think the, where, where should you clip was the question. Should you, you know, like with, um, or 
like chameleon goals or anything like that? Yeah, with like um, fire blight on apples and pears, the bacteria can work its way down the stem beyond where you're seeing the symptoms. But with this one, I think it's only the, the visible tissue. So just, just, you know, I would probably just clip off, well, I'd go back to a node, but I'd just clip off that. But second. don't leave the galls on the ground, right? To put them in a sack and carry them all that? Uh, is, it, is this an insect gall or a fungal gall? Uh, I, you don't remember. I don't remember. I and mean, I think like I, I That's it's it's certainly It's a weird one though. It might be a fungal gall because I remember it being like it didn't feel intuitive. Okay. But I'll I'll sorry. <laughs> it, that's certainly so putting in a bag and getting it away is not a bad idea. Um, certainly out of an abundance of caution. I can't remember specifically if this one is something where there's a risk. Yeah, it's fungus, so it's Exobacidium familiae. I was, that was on the tip of my tongue. I know, right? Oh, right right there. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it was. Right, remember you guys went in doubt. Right. Give me a minute, and I can look that up. <laughs> Expert Google. Expert Google. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's a good idea. Um, can we exclude the pest? Uh, so here's the, um, Oh. Cutworm that gets on different vegetable crops, and uh, uh, I work with a guy who's been with Extension for 40 years, and he recommends, uh, and, it, and it's effective, you know, wrap a little bit of aluminum foil or, or take a, a, a cardboard, the, the inside of a toilet paper roll, cardboard, and you know, put that around the, the stem at the base of the plant. And it's just a barrier to the to those little insect, uh, those little caterpillars that come out of the ground and, and clip that off. Um, you know, here's uh, we can use row covers for frost protection, but we can also use row covers for insect include, exclusion. Uh, you use a lighter weight row cover for that, one that lets a little more light in. And you know, you're not trying to do a thermal barrier; you're just trying to keep the insects out. So exclusion. Um, and then, you know, again, last resort, pesticides. Uh, always, you know, if, if you've got a, ch so, do, do your, uh, no, I've asked you, I'll probably ask you this every time. Do they make pesticide recommendations if, if, if when they come in and advise clients? They can, but it's always kind of whatever. It's typically like you find the fact sheet, whatever is in that fact sheet. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and where that fact sheet, gives you a range of options if from your training or experience or research you know that one of them is has lower toxicity by all means make that recommendation you know um, here's a great option for you it's very low toxicity uh, you know follow the directions and, and, and it works um, so you know these are some great examples the the BT insecticide also is sold as Dipel and Worm Whipper, and it's, um, uh, it's manufactured from a bacteria, um, so it's a natural, naturally derived product. Uh, yeah, the, these, the, these two have the same active ingredient. Very safe. Organic gardeners use these, very low toxicity, low risk of beneficial insects, all that good stuff. Yes? Uh, I just noticed spider webs on my rosemary, so I'm just assuming it's spider mites. Could be. Um, what should be my next identification? Um, uh, so one, one way you can check for spider mites is take a white sheet of paper. Put it down on a table, take a little clipping of a rosemary that's shown the symptoms, and just kind of flick the clipping over the paper, and all kinds of little specks and debris will fall on the paper. And then if any of them move, <laughs> those are your spider mites. You can also, you can, if you've got really good eyes or some good reading glasses, you could probably see them. Um, certainly with 5X magnification, you can see them. And then how do you uh, insecticidal soap 
or horticultural oils are great low toxicity options for that. Um, yeah. um, okay, so yeah, choose least effective. Let's choose least toxic effective option. <laughs> I, I would also say, um, Leah, at least okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't catch up with my humor for a minute. So. Um, Also, I also encourage you to take into account, again, for your own use and, and for discussions with clients, is pollinator protection. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk about how to find this information uh, where, you, where you've got one that has a bee hazard and one that doesn't. You know which one to choose. Uh, if you've got a choice between a liquid formulation and a dust formulation, choose the liquid. Those are those pose less risk for, for pollinators because <coughs> um, the pollinators are liable to collect the dust particles as they're collecting pollen, um, and then you can get adverse effects. All right, so and I, <coughs> one of the things that I think is important for folks to understand is just a little bit of background about how pesticides make it to market because. I think if you understand that, um, it, it increases your confidence in using them and in talking to other people about them and in being able to understand when maybe you're hearing something that is inaccurate. Um, and so the first step, the first you know, kind of ground level information is that all pesticides have to be registered with the United States Environmental Protection Agency, federal agency. And you know, I, I, I acknowledge that they're not completely immune uh, from the you know, political landscape, um, but there's a lot of good science that happens at the EPA. Um, and you know, it's an agency that's been around for decades and they've been doing this for decades. Um, and, and in order for that pesticide to make it to market, it's a comprehensive, very research and intensive process and it starts with efficacy testing. And I'll give you more information about all these than toxic, and it's not necessarily in this order, but generally probably so. Environmental fate, ecological effects, residues on food. So, so that's all part of it. Um, and it's very, very expensive and very time consuming and Actually, it's, it's pretty, uh, at this point, it's pretty unusual for a new pesticide product to come on the market um, because it is so costly and time consuming. And, and of course, there's uh, the, the, you know, the regulations and the knowledge of how pesticides can affect human health and the environment, you know, we took DDT off the market for a reason, you know, we took Bordane off the market, we took Dursban off the market, I mean, off for, for good reason. Um, and so, you know, the pesticides that come out, they have to be safer, they have to be uh, more targeted, they have to, uh, um, you know, safer to the applicator, uh, lower risk as far as environment, et cetera. Um, and it starts with efficacy testing, which is just, you know, this happens in a lab, and is it, does it affect a test of a pest? So, you know, we, some chemist develops some new compound and takes a medicine dropper and drops it on a, 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 a caterpillar. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly like that, but you get the idea. It happens in a lab and they're just seeing, is there an effect on the weed, on the insect or, or the, the disease? Uh, and then, you know, after they do some laboratory testing, they might take it up to a greenhouse and then they might take it out to field plots um, of course, that's going to be very controlled and very small scale, um, but I just had to find a good outdoor photo. Um, and then, you know, we're also, there's also extensive testing about toxicology. Is it harmful to humans? And th th there's a whole suite of research that has to occur uh, in that realm. Uh, is it going to make you sick? Like. If, if it gets on your skin, is it gonna burn? Uh, if it gets in your eyes, is it gonna 
is it going to cause any damage to your eyes? Uh, if you breathe it in and you breathe in fumes, you're going to pass out. So those are kind of the acute effects. But they're also looking at are there chronic long-term effects? You know, am I going to you know develop some illness ten years from now um, because of, of using this pesticide? So this is all part of the testing that goes into the development. There's a class action suit. Many of you may have been contacted already against Roundup for lymphoma, which is something that comes along 10 years later. Um, but I got my notice the other day. God, I don't know. Sure enough, I had bought some Roundup years ago. Haven't used it. I don't have I have a bottle left. But, um, Unfortunately, for some gentlemen who used Roundup inappropriately and chronically developed um, lymphomas, um, and I think eventually a leukemia and died, and so on. He's the only one who's been really ill, but for Roundup Company is in big trouble because of it. Uh, yeah, so. I I, I am happy to use glyphosate, uh, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. I, I use it on a regular basis for weed management on our property. Um, you know, I use it carefully. Uh, and you know, the the other the other piece of that, you know, when you see, I think the other thing you have to think about is your risk of a the risk level for a gardener in using these products versus the risk level of a farm worker. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I mean, you're, I mean, you're, it's, it's just, you know, profound difference between the risk level. So, and, and then the other thing is the, the products that make it onto the homeowner market or that are approved for the homeowner market tend to be, you know, tend to have much, much lower risk than, than what um, professional applicators would use. And that's why professional applicators have to have training and continuing education and have to be certified, you know, so. I, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not, I'm not saying it couldn't be better, but, um, but this is all, all that we're looking at. In this, in this toxicology testing, um, you know, there's, there's just a whole suite, like I said, of, of tests that, that happen on, the, on these products. Um, and then uh, I, I meant to grab a little spray bottle that we use when the cat gets on the counter <laughs> um, and do a little demonstration. What I was gonna do is I was gonna just, and it's just water, but I was gonna squirt it out and then I was going to say, okay, I need a volunteer for somebody to come help me get the spray back in the bottle. Right? <laughs> and, and you can't. So you just have to acknowledge that when we spray, it's out there. We put it out there, and we need to know how it's going to affect the environment. And we do. We, we test that. Um, we're looking at in, impacts on groundwater. Um, some products are susceptible to leaching, where we get a heavy rain and... and the molecules move down with the water and can get into the groundwater, and others don't. Others kind of stay put, or they degrade very quickly uh, in sunlight or in water. You know, they just they just get dissolved and, and broken down into um, uh, you know things that don't have any activity. Um, is there any effect on birds, on fish, or aquatic organisms, bees, or other beneficial insects? Will it leave unsafe residues on food? Uh, in, in my, when I mentioned that um, first part of my career in agriculture, I worked for a pesticide research company. This was the kind of studies that we were doing where uh, the company I worked for was hired by the manufacturer to manage the studies where they take a new product, apply it to the crop, and then harvest that. I was working with bananas and coffee mostly. Um, harvest that, send it to the lab, and then see if any of that pesticide residue could be detected. 
uh, on that harvested crop. So it's science, y'all. I mean, I mean we, we get these answers before we release a product of, into the market. Um, and that should give us some comfort, I think. And, you know, you think about, uh, well, you know, what about the things that we don't, we haven't discovered yet? And, you know, if you told me that in the 40s, you know, I, I would have been, well, yeah, that's kind of scary to think about. But our level of scientific knowledge and our, our, you know, the techniques we have available to us, you know, we just learned so much about how things work. And, and, and so I think we're, I think as a whole, uh, we're able to make better decisions uh, and, and have better answers about those things and make better predictions. Um, so that gives me a lot, a lot of confidence. Yes? Hi. So I've heard farmers say that, like with strawberries, for example, they don't spray the fruit that they sprayed on the balloon stage. Does that mean that it doesn't go into the fruit at all? Um, no. That depends on what they're using. Um, that's probably uh, mostly true, um, but there could be, I mean, I don't know enough specifically about, you know, the products that they might use in strawberry Let's production. Let's say it was like ground up or, you know, something that had glyphosate in it or something like that. Well, they wouldn't use glyphosate on strawberries oh, okay. <laughs> because yeah. it would kill the plants. Yeah. Um, so, but, um, it, you know, is there an insecticide, for example? I mean, the big issue in, in, in strawberries is um, insect management and disease management. And if there was an insecticide, it's possible that they would use an insecticide that had some systemic activity in the plant. Um, but yeah, mostly, and, and the other thing that will, let me bookmark that question, and I'm going to give you some information that I think will help with, with that question. It's a great question. So let, let me get to that, and so I don't jump ahead myself. So bottom line, pesticides are studied rigorously. EPA does the, the approval. And, and there's also a re-review process. So things come, um, come up for review on a cycle, and so they take a fresh look. And this has happened uh, with, um, I'm trying to think of anything, but you know, diazinon used to be something that people would put out on their lawns uh, for insect control. Um, and it's not available anymore because it came up for re-review and they said, mm, no, we've got new information and uh, we're, we're gonna take that off of that market. Um, so again, all this just gives me a lot of confidence that they're safe if they're used correctly and judiciously. And again, remember, that was the starting point, and that's where I wanted to end up, is that they should be used, um, uh, there were three words, sparingly, correctly, I don't know. As, as a last resort, yeah, so. But if, if, we're, if we're following that approach, then I think we can use them with confidence. And so they go through that whole registration process with all those studies, all that documentation, all that science that gets submitted to the, S, uh, the EPA for approval, and it results in the label. Like that label is, all the information on the label is based on that science. It's not random, it's not some, you know, English major, uh, nothing against English majors <laughs> that came out wrong. I love English, I like to read. <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's it, you know, that, that label is based on the science. It's based on the results of the toxicology research and the environmental fate. And, and so all the specific instructions as far as rate and how to protect yourself and how to protect your family and the environment, it's, it's on there and it's based on that science. And you know, if you buy a piece of furniture from Amazon or Ikea that you have to assemble yourself at home. I don't care if you read the instructions. <laughs> I, you know, you, being, you do you, okay? But if you're making a pesticide application, I care a lot <laughs> that you read the instructions and that I read the instructions when I'm using them, using them. And it's about, number one, protecting yourself as the applicator. It's about protecting 
the people and animals that share your space, uh, including pets, wildlife. Um, it's about protecting the environment. It's about protecting our communities, okay? Um, so yeah, you need to read the instructions. And honestly, you know, fair point, they're not super user friendly. They've gotten better, and especially for the consumer, um, they've gotten better. But one thing that we're gonna do um, is I've got a, a, a label reading exercise for you. So I've got a, a label that I printed off the internet and we're gonna look at that and I've got questions for you to try to answer. Um, and and it's, it's, it's law that you, you, you're supposed to follow those instructions, that's the law. And so for example, if you go out and it, you know you use seven dust, which is fine. I mean, I'm not a big fan because I'd rather you use the same active ingredient in a liquid formulation. But you're allowed to. My, I went to see my grandmother, my, my mother-in-law, um, this summer, and she loves the garden. And we went out there, and she was sprinkling seven dust on everything, and it works, and it's fine. It was legal. It was safe. Um, but if you apply seven dust on something that is in bloom and your neighbor is a beekeeper and your neighbor's bees come over and are visiting your blooming crops and happen to also collect some of the seven dust and it kills the beehive, you just bought yourself a beehive. <laughs> um, I mean, you're liable for that. You're liable for that misapplication. You can also get fined if, if your neighbor calls the Department of Agriculture, they'll send out an inspector, um, and, uh, and so, so it's, it's, it's illegal. All right, um, and, 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 and so, so the, the, the information that's on the label, and I won't go into the specifics, because um, I wanna make sure we have time for the exercise, but it's, it's very well spelled out what's on that label. It's, it's all spelled out by law. It's approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. Every label is gonna have the same set of information and it's often in sort of a regular order um, so that if, if, if you start to read them, you'll begin to get familiar and know where to find the information that you need more quickly and easily. And again, I gotta emphasize, you know, we're not just talking about synthetic pesticides, we're also talking about natural pesticides that might be used in an organic situation. Same, same thing applies. So. Um, but you're gonna have um, all kinds of safety and information directions for use, environmental hazards, storage and disposal, basically everything you need to do to be successful so that you haven't wasted your money, protect your family, protect yourself, protect the environment. It's all there. You, you just need to read and understand and follow it. Um, so in, instead of going through all of that, why don't we go ahead and do the label reading exercise. Do you want me to hand them out? Sure. So um, there's 10 questions, um, so just you know, write them down on a piece of paper. Um, does anybody need like a pen or a piece of paper? Okay. And um, <laughs> 10 questions, I'll put up the first five questions for five minutes and then I'll put up the, the next five and then we'll discuss and you have to get at least eight of them right to proceed as a master burner. <laughs> this is a learning experience and intentionally some of these questions are tricky. The other thing I want to comment about is um, I, I've used this same product uh, for the same exercise 
many times, uh, but I, I printed out a new copy for this class because it has changed. And the reason that it's changed is because new information, new restrictions on how we're using it, and, and, and so I had to so, I mean, again, that gives me confidence that we're paying attention, we're in safety, and, and all that stuff is improving um, over time. Oh, wait, okay. should we turn on the light? toxicity are caution, warning, and danger. And it's usually in a larger font. <laughs> and it's always on the front. And you guys can talk amongst yourselves. Mm -hmm. 